Having discovered the chromosomal aberration that causes Down syndrome, French physician and geneticist Jerome Lejeune had dark forebodings over the medicalized discrimination, in effect abortion, that would result from the discovery in utero of an unborn child with Down syndrome. Giving speeches at scientific conferences, Lejeune insisted, For thousands of years, medicine has striven to fight for life and health against disease and death. Any reversal of this order would entirely change medicine itself. Knowing the toll this stance would take on his career, he wrote to his wife, Today I lost my Nobel Prize. Mark Bradford, the venerable Jerome Lejeune Fellow for the Word on Fire Institute on his own life and the significant life and work of Jerome Lejeune, now. My name is Todd Warner, and this is the Evangelization and Culture Podcast from Word on Fire. Mark Bradford has had a diverse array of experiences, with roles ranging from public high school teacher in Santa Barbara, to director of sacred music at Philadelphia's St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, to headmaster at a Pittsburgh independent Catholic school, Mark ultimately found himself serving as executive vice president of the National Catholic Bioethics Center. It was there that he first came across the name Jerome Lejeune. Mark now serves as the venerable Jerome Lejeune Fellow of the Word on Fire Institute, and I am blessed to call Mark colleague and friend. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Todd. It's such a pleasure and a privilege to be here, and uh, I share that joy of being with you today. It's a great opportunity to have a conversation. Thanks so much. Segment one, the Catholic conversion of Mark Bradford. In October 1987, a young man threw his backpack into his car, drove alone to Yosemite National Park, and hiked 11,000 feet up a mountainside trail. After a short stay, that same man recorded, the decision was made, And next morning, I packed up my gear and went trudging down the mountain, convinced to become a Catholic. That young man, of course, was Mark Bradford. Mark, what happened on top of that mountain? Well, Todd, I don't know if you watched any of King Charles' coronation or saw any of the pictures, but you know that time when they brought the screen around and they veiled the most sacred moment of the conversation? So I can't tell you about it, really, but (laughs) no, it was was an incredible time, you know? God put me on the fast track, I think, to becoming a Catholic. I I left the church that I had grown up in in July of that same year in 1987, and it was sort of adrift and encountered the Catholic Church earlier through a woman that would later become my wife, and was sort of troubled that I was adrift and knew that, actually, I wasn't sure if I believed anything, but Mm -hmm. I knew if there was something there to believe, I should find it. So that put me into an earnest pursuit of what was true. I had been uh, introduced to a poor Clare convent in Santa Barbara, not far from the mission, when the Bishop Baron and Father Steve grew to know very well. And so I went there on a next Sunday after I left the church and after mass, I went for a walk along the seminary grounds and along the Stations of the Cross and had one of those cathartic moments where Mm. I, I realized as I was trying to figure out what the Stations of the Cross represented that I really didn't know Jesus or the story of his life as I thought I did. So I uh, went in earnest pursuit after that, which led me to this moment where I just got to have been dropping little breadcrumbs along Mm -hmm. the way that kept me enticed. I remember very clearly when I was sitting uh, in my backyard in Santa Barbara in the sunshine and reading John chapter 6 and all of a sudden realized that what Jesus said was true about his body and blood in the Eucharist. Um, And then we get to October where things were still just, I couldn't put it all together. So I said, okay, enough. I'm getting out of town. I'm, I'm, I'm going to Yosemite. I'm getting away from everything where no one can bother me. And so that was the motivation to go to Yosemite and to climb up that mountain. So I took with me three things along with some food because I needed to survive. I took, uh, 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 John Henry Newman's essay on the development of Christian doctrine, because mm-hmm. that was a lingering question I had, having grown up in the Church of Christ, a very fundamentalist church. I took a book by Columba Marmion called Christ, the Life of the Soul, and I took a rosary. So I went up the mountain and I just started reading. I read Newman and it made sense with some great amount of struggle. He's yeah. pretty hard for someone who's a, you know, was raised in a, outside of the tradition to read. And then I was praying the rosary, I'd get up every morning, and I'd climb up on the top of a rocky outcrop to try to get warm because it was pretty cold up there that time of year. Yeah. 
And then finally, one evening, I walked down to a lake that was close to where I was camped, set up to camp. And I took the Marmion book, Christ, the Life of the Soul. Mm. And I sat down and leaned up against a rock. I can see that. It was 30 some years ago, but I can see the scene. This is, I, you know, as if it was today. Yeah. And that book opens with this beautiful meditation on the opening verses of Ephesians, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And where he says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and unspotted in his sight and love, and that he had predestined us into the adoption of children through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, and to the praise and glory of his grace, that he had graced us in his beloved son. And it was just in reading those verses that everything was like there was this revelation, there was this burst of light that that made clear to me what I had missed all along and all this mm. pursuit. It was God's overwhelming love that was drawing us to himself. And he had provided for us through his son, Jesus Christ, and adopted us through him to be perfected according to his will and by his grace. Mm. So that was the moment. Everything, at least I thought everything was clear. It was one other little hiccup along the way, but but it became clear. I, I, I went to bed that night. I packed up my pack and I went trenching down the mountain and... I had encountered a priest at Thomas Aquinas College in Ojai, California, who was a chaplain there. I'd been put in touch with him through who became my brother-in-law, who was a student there. And he had been moved. He was stationed in Modesto, California. So I stopped to see him on my way back to tell him I had made the decision to convert. And that mm-hmm. was it. It was, uh, it was an incredible... Uh, it was an incredibly profound and uh, indescribable time. Uh, when I got back to... See Father Vincent Young, who is his priest. I I was suspended someplace between heaven and earth. I really, wow. honestly, through the night, didn't know where I was. I was just, it, the constellations were overwhelming. So it was an incredible gift, incredible gift. You know, it, it, it is, it's, it sounds like an incredible story. And I was, I was curious, as you were going up the mountain, uh, did, did, it, did, you, did it strike you that you were, again, you knew you had to kind of get away to a place quiet, you needed to be reflective, needed to be prayerful and so on. Was it, do you feel like you needed just one more push or were you going up the mountain kind of befuddled and, and with lots of consternation? Where, where were you at the beginning of the trip? Uh, again, I know the transformative nature of when you came back down, but you know, there's some people that are going through conversion processes where it's, it's a, as I like to say, it's a thousand brushstrokes that ultimately uh, put, put a portrait together and you're like, you step back and say, aha, there it is. And there's others that they're knocked off the horse, like, like Saul becoming Paul, um, just and I'm not trying to be put too fine of a point on what's a what's an indescribable experience. I'm just curious, w- going up that mountainside, was it sort of a w- were you in a point of consternation or were you sort of like I'm I'm close but not quite there and this might push me over the top? I went up the mountain determined to not come down until I had an answer. Wow. So you know there were a lot of factors at play. I was raised in the Church of Christ, as you said. I. You know, my family was deeply involved in the Church of Christ for generations. My father had three brothers, and two of them were preachers. Um, the other two, including my father, were elders in the church, so they had positions of leadership and the sort of loose structure that's there in that in that fundamentalist church. So there was a lot of familial pressure. Mm. The church, the Roman Catholic Church, was viewed, and I was raised to believe the Roman Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon. You know, filled yeah, with evil, yeah. and the, you know the priests were getting drunk off of altar wine and all that sort of yeah. nonsense, absolute nonsense. So I had to work through the detachment from my family. And that mm-hmm. began actually when my father called uh, that first time that I had made the commitment to leave that church. It was a Wednesday and there was a Bible study on Wednesday night. So my father called to wonder where I was that night. And I said, I'm not coming back. And that really began the whole process of trying to trying to come to terms with with what it meant to leave the faith that I was raised in and the, the impact that that would have on my parents and on my yeah. family. And others that I had grown up with is a very tight knit group of people. It was only 70 people in the church in Santa Barbara. So that was tough. So I went up the mountain with all of that in mind, certainly. Yeah. And as I said, God was giving me little, was drawing me in by bit, bit by bit. And, as I mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the realization of the reality of Jesus' presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. So, but I just, I, again, I couldn't put it together. I couldn't mm. make sense of it. I couldn't make sense of it in terms of, of what that meant for my family, what it meant for me. I had been in this relationship with the woman who I would later marry, Denise. 
And I didn't want to make any decisions because of her, although we had broken up long before that because we realized that we couldn't come to an agreement on religion. There was nowhere for our, our relationship to grow. Sure. So I, I, there were all these factors involved in that, which I'm sure is true in every conversion. It wasn't a straight line. Yeah. So I went up the mountain confused, a little disoriented, thinking it was probably true, but I couldn't put it all together. I couldn't shed what I had been raised with. I, you know, I was praying the rosary, so I guess I must have gotten past the issue with the Blessed Virgin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a commitment. I had to, I, I guess I put God to the test. I said, okay, yeah. I, I've got so much food. I'm going up this mountain. I, I'm not leaving until this is sorted out. And I guess he had mercy on me because it was pretty cold up there and knew I couldn't manage for too long. So I think I was up there, I don't remember now, three or four days. And then uh, that beautiful sunny evening by that lake. It all just came crystal clear. It's an amazing story, Mark, and I appreciate you sharing because I think there's a lot of listeners out there that find themselves kind of caught up between the past and the future, um, family tensions on one side, the the fu- a future family on the other, um, between the intellectual apprehension and also, if you say, the mystical or the very intimate relationship with God and, and, and trying to understand a person's path forward. And, and and what's interesting is you go up there with the very heady intellectual work of Newman's, which is, which is brilliant, but it, but it seems like that in tandem with the other reading you were doing, I think by Marmion, you said, and, and the profound amount of prayer. Um, when you quote what the, the, the line that you quoted, it was not an intellectual a- apprehension necessarily. It sounds more, it was an overwhelming sense of love. Uh, ultimately, that that kind of was was maybe the, a, a decisive factor in your journey down the mountain and into a new life, and it's a profound story. And I and I and I, I just I think we, you and I probably would both. I'm a, I'm a convert myself, um, with a different background with my family and so on. But I would say to those out there who are in this you know contemplative state, but also a state of great tension, um, a certain amount of yes, diligent intellectual work, but also surrender to God and to the graces that. God and and uh, Mary interceding on our behalf can offer is um, it's it's an extraordinary thing and you're a testimony to that I think that's I think that's thank you for sharing that I, I, I wanted to ask you Mark then so so moving forward you're welcomed in the Catholic Church in 1987 and you married Denise I believe two years later in 1989 if I'm not mistaken that's right yes you have you have a, a, a vibrant uh, family of seven five daughters and two sons. Um, what is what is the journey of Catholicism look like for you as a, as a married couple and as a family? My wife Denise was a revert, I guess you could say. You sure. know, she she was very involved in musical theater and uh, was having quite a bit of success in the Los Angeles area, doing shows down there, and really. You know, she never completely abandoned belief. Primarily, she always held on to her belief in the Eucharist and realized she could find that nowhere else. But I think it was a moral life of the people that she was working with in the theater community. But she just got this turned turned away from it and came back to Santa Barbara. So my journey into the faith was largely her journey back to the faith as well. Mm. She had gotten connected to another priest at Thomas Aquinas College, just wonderful older Jesuit priest uh, named Gerard Steckler, who was an historian and just, just a wonderful man. So, you know, her journey was back, my journey was in. Mm. And, you know, my my experiences were so profound. I came down from that mountain, drove back to Santa Barbara, and my first stop was at her house to tell me that I had decided to convert. Wow. And then we stayed up the whole night together, praying and talking. And So we went into, well, a little hiccup along the way, I guess, is that I, I, the experience of intimacy with Christ was so profound, I couldn't imagine sharing that with anyone else. Yeah. So yeah. I considered a religious vocation for a while, and, and by the advice of the priest I was seeing, left Santa Barbara and came east and stayed in a Benedictine monastery for three months in Massachusetts, what's now St. Benedict's Abbey in Still River, which was a great sort of formative and solidifying experience for me too. But I knew that as much as I love that life, I... I it wasn't the life for me. And sure. so I did go down to graduate school in Princeton and then was there for a year and went back and asked Denise to marry me. So that was the beginning of the whole thing. But in the context of that is this this deep commitment that both of us had formed to the faith through my conversion and through her reversion, I guess you could say. So 
we married with a commitment that our life would be dedicated to the church and serving our family through our love for God first. So the faith was always at the center of our family life. Um, you know, it's a tough time for kids to grow up in, and unfortunately we've had the fallout in our family that others have too. Some of our children have left the faith, and, and I'm saddened to have to say that. And it's always a mystery of how that happens in the context of a family that tries yeah. to, you know, tries to uphold the faith and live the faith as closely as we can. But the lure of the world is just too, too strong in many cases. But we have this great rosary campaign going on now. I'm logging my yeah. rosary. We're going on fire every day, praying for return. First and foremost, of my children who have left the faith, but but for everyone as well. So yeah, the faith is the center. Our house looks like a religious art museum. You know, we we have coffee tables piled up with religious books and you know it's it's in the air we breathe we're very committed to our parish i used to do sacred music as you mentioned and i've done that at our parish and others as well so i was always kids were always at mass so i was always in the choir loft when they were younger but it, it's we can't imagine living our life my wife and i in any other way than with god and the church at the center of it it's 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 the blessing through which all things flow and and that's the love that you have for your spouse certainly it's the love and concern you have for your children and in the mystery of god's providential and permissive will some will stay and some will leave and we continue to pray that they'll return someday and realize that the world is not offering them the richness and the beauty and the love that I mentioned before that I discovered in reading Marmion's book and just in the meditation on those first few verses in the book of Ephesians. Yeah. The love is profound. And and <clears throat> if we don't live according to our nature, and our nature is our adoption through Christ as sons and daughters of God, then we'll, we'll ultimately never find happiness. So our prayer for them is that whatever God has to do to get them back, he does. And we trust that he'll do that. Amen. St. Monica, pray for us, right? Yes, absolutely. Segment two, teacher and leader. When Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia arrived at the last question of his oral comprehension examination in history at Georgetown University, he was pleased to be asked, quote, of all the historical events you have studied, which one, in your opinion, had the most impact upon the world, end quote. Thinking it was a slam dunk, he chose one of the many options, like the Battle of Thermopylae, Lepanto, the American Revolution, that couldn't be necessarily called wrong. The asking professor's eyes saddened, and he shook his head. The right answer was, of course, the Incarnation. Mark, as a man who has dedicated a large amount of your life to teaching or forming teachers, you have made this definitive observation. The Incarnation is the foundation of a Catholic curriculum. Could you elaborate on this notion? I guess I see history sort of broken into segments of time. I think there's everything that came up to in anticipation of the incarnation and everything that's happened since. So especially the culture of the West, which was largely developed through that moment and reflection on that moment sheds light on who we are as human persons. You know, Bishop Barron, when he was in uh, London, had this great conversation with Tom Holland, who's an author, a historian, and he wrote this book called Dominion that I was inspired to read after listening to the conversation that Bishop Barron had with him. And Dominion is his attempt, I think, to understand how, how the Western mind was formed. I think that may be the subtitle of the book. He himself was raised, I think, in the Church of England at one point, fell away, and is now either an atheist or an agnostic. But he realizes that everything that he lives and breathes around him was formed by Christ, by the church. Yeah. So the moment of the incarnation was a profound one. You know, John Paul II in his first encyclical, Redemptor Home, and he says this great statement. He says, only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. So when I make that statement about the incarnation being the source of the classical curriculum, the classical curriculum is about coming to understand God's creation and the human person as the disciplines are divided between the humanities and the arts and science, both of which in a classical context are contained within what we call the, the trivium and the quadrivium, the mm -hmm. seven liberal arts. Yeah. So 
just like St. Paul, and you know, we can come to know God by those things that he's created, as he tells us in the book of Romans. We come to know who we are as we come to understand more fully the person of Christ. And going again back to Marmion and that love that God had for us was expressed most profoundly in the incarnation. And it's only in coming to understand the love that God has for us that he has shared with us by giving us his son through whom our human dignity is realized can we come to understand what we're called to be. So the great works of literature are reflective on the human person. Right. They're reflective on the, the, the virtues and the vices and the consequences of each and show us God's love and how, once again, living in accordance with our nature and our adoption as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ uh, can be realized. So it's very instructive in that way. I think a classical curriculum, and I know classical, there, there are charter schools, for example, around the country now that are, are classical schools and they're secular schools by nature because they're charter schools. They're essentially public sure. schools. But I'm always kind of amazed how, and I've talked to several people about this actually, that work in the schools. My daughter was one of them at one point. How you can really teach in the classical tradition, tradition without reflecting on the incarnation of the yeah. of Christ in the midst of it all. So it, to be well-formed as a human person, and we know that the incarnation wasn't just for Catholics, the incarnation was for every individual that has ever lived and ever will live in any, any nook and cranny of the world. Without, without acknowledging that reality and without coming to understand how God's love is expressed for us through Jesus Christ and the consequences of our actions as human persons, the temptations that we have as a result of the fall and our inclination to sin, we can't, unless we fully understand how that plays out in human existence, has played out to the moment at which we live right now. You know, if you take that moment of the incarnation and you look forward to what happened after the fall of Rome and the so-called dark ages, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how there could be. Con I can't see darkness in those dark ages. Right, right. But, but you know, it was this incredible moment of of the development. It was like an incubator for the faith that burst on the world mm. and, and just spread to every corner. Following in the tradition of the apostles, as once we, once the faith began once again to flow out of the monasteries and throughout, we can see what happens in the Renaissance and the glorious uh, testimony when the late Middle Ages and Renaissance of the cathedrals, etc. We can see the beauty that the faith provides. And we can see what happens in, you know, those Middle Ages, medieval period, where, where everything was seen through a lens of the transcendent God. We understood then that everything, everything was this gift. It, we, that was the only way we could explain anything around us. As we get later on in the development of the human culture and the Renaissance, we began to see more interest in the capabilities of man, I guess you could say. Yeah. Uh, we, we have Renaissance humanism, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And we see this gradual moving away. The eyes are beginning to be lowered from the heavens to the earth. We see in the Enlightenment, the results of the Enlightenment, the French Revolution and the horror that that caused. And when... There was a ripping away of the faith from the culture that people lived in, what happened. And then ultimately to the time we live in today, where our eyes can't go heavenward. Our eyes now are, are, are locked solely in the earth, and it's all about the interplay of power dynamics in mm. society. There's mm. no sense that we're looking upward to guidance from God, to our ultimate destiny, and to our calling in Christ. So we can see the consequences of that all around us. Yeah. And, and that is a classical curriculum. And that can only be drawn effectively if our if our source for all that we do is found in Jesus in the incarnation of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Sorry, so, I'm giving a long answer. No, 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 no. I love this. <laughs> I'm just kind of, I'm transfixed. I'm loving this. Uh, no, you know it's funny because you make me think about the, 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 one of the simplified versions of the narrative I, I come to again and again about. Our, our Catholic narrative is dignified, fallen, redeemable. Um, and and I, I, that we, are, we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are dignified. We have ineradicable dignity, not because of one fragment of who we are as people, because of race, sex, um, nationality, et cetera, et cetera. We are dignified because we are children of God. We are, we, are, we are divinely made, crafted, and loved into existence. 
but we are also fallen from the original sin to our to our daily struggles with temptation and, and appetites and so on and so forth. And yet we're redeemable. And and the that that to me is all embodied in the story of the incarnation that God would love us so much as to deign to come down to humble Himself to 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 teach to serve and show us how to serve to die on our behalf and to wed uh, mercy and justice in that one brilliance sublime ineffable act on the cross and then to resurrect to show us the promise of of eternal life and so on i i i, I to your point I, I this is why i love teaching about literature is that absolutely literature that falls away from the from even the echoes of a dignified fallen redeemable narrative um it warps us you know and, and chesterton in one of his works says you know um that we are all that man who has forgotten who he who he is that we we sometimes wander blindly around um, uh, having lost track of our identity in the modern world, and to borrow from Bernano uh, in the Diary of a Country Priest, we become stumps of men. We become hollowed out portions or broken down portions or fragmentary portions of what we are called to be. And I think a lot of modern ideology, especially, it wants to say you are not dignified because there is no God. You, you are you are kind of you're a broken down worm. You're just a creature like every other kind of dirty creature on earth. Or um, you are you are either fallible and and not redeemable, or you're not fallible. You're perfect as you are, and let your hedonism run, and so on. Um, or finally, that you're not again, you're not redeemable. That 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 this is where it all ends, and so on. And I think that is enough for to cast people into despair because it runs counter. I think first to our instincts of our own existence, um, and and second, it it it. Uh, it ultimately leads to our own to to nihilism and our own kind of uh, destruction, and so what you're saying, uh, I, I, I just I couldn't agree more. I think I think you're hitting the nail right on the head. Let me, let me ask you this, Mark. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about as you as you got into teaching. You were a trumpet player in your youth, and and uh, and uh, you pursued a teaching career in music, and you were directing a public uh, band at a public high school, and so on. Um, let's talk about teaching and what 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 did you find? Um, fulfilling what did you find ennobling in the work of instructing younger individuals and cultivating their individual talents and then pulling them together from individuals to a concert a, a body of, of of people making be- beautiful music what was your experience as a teacher with young people yeah uh, you know i was really young when i started teaching i think i might have been 21 or you were the cool teacher to turn 22 yeah i was a cool one and boy did i get taken advantage of <laughs> I really got taken advantage of in the process. You know, the kids kept saying, "Oh, you know, we're, you know, I would had a band room, and there were practice rooms on the side, and in those days there were no windows into the practice rooms." And the guys say, "Oh, yeah, you know, everything's okay. We, that we've always used this room. We call yeah. it the Keegan room." And, and I think, "Oh," and I went in there one day, and I thought, "Oh, I see what you're using this room for." Yeah. <laughs> So it was great. You know, I wasn't a Catholic then. I, I was in the Church of Christ, and I, I, I've always, I've never been satisfied with the way things are, and I always wanted to make things different or better in some way. So I took this program, and I decided I was going to completely reconfigure the whole thing, and, and did, and got a lot of the kids and a lot of the parents involved in doing it, and it was a great time. I made a lot of friendships with the kids and their parents back then. Some of those have lingered to today, and we don't stay in touch regularly with them. But I ended up being the best man for one of my students' weddings mm. at one point. And, wow! You know, and others will stay in touch periodically and come by to visit. Even from then, and that was I left teaching in nineteen, well, nineteen eighty-seven, I guess it was. Yeah. Um, to go back to graduate school, I thought, and then the whole Catholic conversion thing happened in the interim. So it was a great experience, really. You know, you're working with kids and. The world was a much different place in the 1980s than it is now, certainly. And it was in Santa Barbara and a great school. And so I, I didn't really spend as much time with my colleagues as I wish I had been because the kids were more relatable to me. Sure. So I was always in the room and the kids were always around eating lunch in my office and hanging out. And we, it was a great, it was a great time. Yeah. I would, you know, if I was going back and doing it again at this point in life, God forbid, I, I never want to go up that road again. But I would do it a little bit differently, I think, but it was a great experience to work with kids and see them develop pride and accomplishment. And we had a lot of successes. It was a lot of fun. 
Yeah, that's great. You know, uh, while challenging the students in your high school, you've had to take a more nuanced approach with your son, Thomas, at home. Thomas, your son has Down syndrome. And I just wanted to ask you to tell us what, as a as a person with a teaching background um, up to that point in 1987, um, what have you learned about raising and teaching Thomas with the, with the given needs that he has? Patience. You know, it, it's, a, it's a different pathway. And... Intellectual disability is an amazing thing, and we've learned a lot through our son. You know, he's he has an incredibly logical mind. He plays piano beautifully. There are some mm. things that he can do when he's approached in the right kind of way, and my wife is just brilliant with all of this. She's, you know, I spend all my time working, and she's at home with the kids and has done so much for him and for all of them. But he has a, you know, he loves Power Rangers, and he will catalog everything. He's very specific in his wow. organization of things. So he knows every Power Ranger, every actor that played every Power Ranger in every season of Power Rangers was ever made. And he's got his room full of them and posters on the walls. But, you know, it just shows you that, that intellect, when there's an intellectual disability, it doesn't yeah. mean that there's a lack of intellect. Yeah. It just means that it goes through a different pathway. And everyone has a different style of learning. Um, you know, well, not everyone, I suppose. There are categories that we can put people in so we know how to approach learning with them. But your, your expectations change. You yeah. learn to be patient. You learn to answer the same questions over and over and over again. Um, but you learn to appreciate the beauty of the individual mm. that is there and, and regret the, you know, in a sense, you regret the impediments that he himself sees in his own life. Mm. Uh, and wish that they weren't there, but at the same time, you acknowledge that they are there, and that's who he is as a human person, that's who he's created to be, and that's who he is, and gift to us and to others. So everything just slows down a little bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I haven't ever really been known for patience in my past. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this was a great gift, great gift to me, really, to just still am challenged to be patient and to answer the same questions and to, you know, love them. Just love yeah. Them. You know, you, you mentioned that about, um, having an intellectual disability doesn't mean that you don't have an intellect or, or the capacity for in, an intellect and so on. I, I love that. And I, I just listening to uh, what you said about Thomas with the power Rangers, I'm like, you know, power Rangers might have a, a, a resurgence, uh, in the market if they, if they've, get Thomas on the, in front of a camera and decide to, to use him for PR. I'm sure he'd do wonders for them, um, given his passion for it and his knowledge about it. What are, are there any other myths or misconceptions, um, that you would say kind of are pervasive about, about, uh, people with intellectual or developmental dis disabilities that you would just say a word or two about, um, you know, for, for our listeners? Sure. You know, I think one of the lethal perceptions is that they're somehow less than human. Mm. And if it's better than it used to be, I, I can't, you, you mentioned Power Rangers having a resurgence. <laughs> I hope someone's <laughs> listening to that. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had about Barbie dolls. I've been on EWTN, <laughs> on Newsmax. I did something on Long Island Radio yesterday about the dance Barbie with Dan <laughs> So <laughs> it's been an amazing thing. So yeah, maybe we need a, a Power Ranger with Down Syndrome. <laughs> but... I think in the past, no one understood intellectual disability. And this is one of the great gifts of Jerome Lejeune, because he, he began to change the culture away from that idea that there was something less than human that John Langdon Down, frankly, had, had promoted in his identification of the syndrome by where the term Mongolism came from. Mm -hmm. This was assigning ethnic categories to individuals, and somehow they were somewhat less than human, you know, just the way we used to identify people of color in this culture, a horrible thing. Yeah. So I think of anything we have to understand, as Jerome Lejeune really stressed, that that everyone has different gifts. Some people are very gifted at math or the sciences or whatever. But some people are just more purely human. You know, some people have the gifts of empathy and compassion and love and a deep understanding and appreciation for the arts, but they can't calculate as well and they can't remember as well and other things. But does that mean that they're not, they don't have a gift to offer to the, yeah. to the culture that they encounter and they really do. 
And in many cases, Todd, I think those gifts are, are profound. And they're gifts that the culture we live in now is really profoundly in need of. Yeah. Yeah, well said. It is a it is an interesting thing to have someone so important in your life remind you of something that you so often forget. And and I imagine you see the graces of God come through that, like you said, with patience or what have you, that it's like, uh, boy, this is a, it's a reminder of something that I'm kind of blasting by in my life. And I thank my son, Thomas, for reminding me of it. Hi, I'm Todd Warner, Managing Editor of Evangelization and Culture, the Journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Word on Fire is a global evangelical community that exists to provide our members with the resources they need to proclaim Christ to a secular culture. Our award-winning quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture, is offered exclusively to Word on Fire Institute members. It's a tangible representation of our mission and goal to lead with beauty in order to bring others to the knowledge of truth. Inside each issue, you'll find writing from premier scholars and inspiring pieces on literature, culture, and daily life from fellow missionaries on the journey to know and serve Christ. Get a copy of the current issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal for free by visiting wordonfire.org slash journal. Thank you, and join us in bringing Christ to a hungry culture. Segment three, a man named Jerome Lejeune. French pediatrician and geneticist Jerome Lejeune insisted, we need to be clear. The quality of a civilization can be measured by the respect it has for its weakest members. There is no other criterion. So Mark, how are we doing on this? And if we are not using Jerome Lejeune's criterion, what criterion are we using? Really good question, Todd. You know, I think we're, in some segments, we're doing better than we used to. Hmm. Again, the institutions are largely gone. The, you know, the laws have been changing that are um, for better or for worse, in my own opinion. But I think ultimately for the better, you can't have these aggregate settings anymore where you bring a bunch of people in with disabilities and put them in like a workhouse kind of environment, which is a crass way to say it because they're not really workhouses anymore as much. But, but at the same time, uh, we know the reality and the statistics and the number of, of babies that are prenatally diagnosed in utero that have some sort of genetic anomaly who the parents elect to abort. And in the case of Down syndrome, it's hard to get a real number there, but it's anywhere. You know, it was a research paper that showed it was about 67% overall. There's some research that says it's more like 75 in the United States, 75%. Varies by region of the country. Some countries have made the commitment to completely eliminate Down syndrome, like Denmark. Uh, interestingly, where Jerome Lejeune's wife, Beard was from. She was a Danish woman. Hmm. So in some areas, we're doing better, and in some areas, we're not. Uh, I think. Again, it's interesting. There was a situation not too long ago where there was a city councilman in Massachusetts that was quoted at a council meeting and representing, I think, the Department of Health or something like that, that they were evaluating the presence of a pro-life pregnancy center in the community. And he was critical of this. And he said, you know, how can we trust these people to not miss uh, a marker for Down syndrome. Oh my gosh! And if they do, and this this child is brought to birth, then then what it will cost our society and additional educational costs for special education for this person and care is is we can't, we can, we've got to make certain that we don't we don't miss anything here. We can't put that burden on society and culture. Unbelievable. The backlash. It is unbelievable. The backlash that he got for that was beautiful to see. Oh, good. There were there were people from every corner slamming him. I think he backed down uh, from his comments, and he might have. And I'm not certain about this, and maybe I shouldn't say in this context. I think he ultimately resigned. But uh, so it was great to see how the advocates pounced on him. Yes, and put that down quickly, and caused him to back down. And now. You know, I joked about all the conversations I'm having about this Barbie doll, but we see Mattel wanting to include an individual that's representative of a disability. That just 
you know, dolls are friends. Little girls, yeah, friends are, yeah. Our daughters had a gazillion Barbie dolls around. <laughs> so if they can have a little friend that looks like them for yeah. little girls who have Down syndrome, or other yeah. girls who are typical girls who don't, it 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 opens the culture more to that. We also have a real push on inclusive education now, which I think is a great thing. Yeah. So children are much more accustomed to seeing individuals in their schools that have disabilities. We mm. have the Best Buddies program that's pairing individuals with disabilities with typical kids. So I think we're making progress. Sure. But in all types of cultural progress, it's slow and it doesn't go as quickly as some of us would like to see. But I think we're doing better. We're getting closer to what Jerome Lejeune had hoped for. You realize yeah. when he first made his discovery, they thought that you could catch it, you know, or they thought that Down syndrome would result of syphilis or some yeah. horrible yeah. thing. And people would cross the street to avoid having to come in contact with someone with Down syndrome. And again, the institutionalization was horrific, as we yeah. know. We yeah. don't have that anymore. Can you, obviously we've been was speaking about uh, Jerome Lejeune this whole time. Can you, let's, let's introduce him. Uh, tell us a little bit about the biography of this, uh, this incredible man. Yeah, Jerome Jean essentially was a Parisian. He grew up in a suburb of Paris. And and um, I think his father was a third order Franciscan, actually. Mm. And so he grew up close to the faith. And he, we're speaking of classical education earlier, he was really, he was schooled in that context. Um, his his Latin was exquisite. You know, some someone said he can read Latin like some people read the newspaper or something like oh, wow. that. So he had a great foundation, great education. He had an aspiration to be a, a doctor um, by reading, I think it was a book of Balzac. And now I don't remember. No, not Balzac, sorry. Um, oh, who was it? I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, where there's a, a country doctor represented in the, in the novel, French novel. And so some say that he was inspired to become a doctor through that, which he did. And... And then he, he wanted to be a surgeon. He missed his exams to qualify for that. So he became a, ultimately a geneticist and he began working in a clinic of a physician in Paris that had a clinic of individuals with Down syndrome, which ignited his curiosity about what caused it. So he saw certain markers in these individuals that he thought, well, there must be a, just, there must be a genetic cause, like the palmar crease in the hands, whatever. He thought there must be a genetic cause for Down syndrome and began to investigate that. But the tools hadn't yet been developed that would enable someone to peer into the genome to identify what that might be. So one of his colleagues named Marc Gauthier had been on fellowship at Harvard and had learned this technique of, uh, of karyotyping and brought the technique back to Paris and joined the clinic of Turpin as well. So it was through the ongoing development of that process of karyotyping, which is is pumping up a cell, I think with colchicine, and then you smash out the cell and you can you can separate the nucleus of the cell, you can separate out the individual chromosomes and then you snip them all. We have, as we know, 23 pairs of chromosomes in a typical individual. Then they would pair those up because they vary according to size and they would be able to count them. So he was working one night on a karyotype of one of his patients and when he was matching up the chromosomes, he got to the 21st chromosome and there was an extra one thrown in there. So he realized that that moment then the Down syndrome was caused by an extra copy of the 21st chromosome mm. and therefore came to be called trisomy 21 right. for that reason. So when he made that discovery and, and they, they did further research to validate the findings that they had, of course, like any good scientist would do, right? You don't just take one instance of something and assume you, that's not your... Maybe your Eureka moment, but it, it's not your moment that you want to publish. Yeah. So they validated the research and then published it in a paper with all three as authors, Jerome Lejeune who's a principal author, and then also Marc Gauthier and Raymond Topin, who was the, was the head of the lab, the primary investigator in the lab where he worked. So that sort of threw him on a, on a stellar path of recognition all throughout the world, really. Mm. And because he had identified for the first time that you could you could tie some <clears throat> disease or disability to a genetic cause. So that launched this field of cytogenetics, which is just that, it's, the, it's being able to relate a disease or investigate the causes of disease or the treatment of disease by looking at the genome, which since the Human Genome Project has exploded. Um, 
and he toured the world. He was involved to ask him to, to speak at many scientific congresses. Uh, he realized also with his discovery that he had unlocked the pathway to prenatal diagnosis because amniocentesis was being used about at this time for the first time hmm. to be able to analyze the, the, you know, the amniotic fluid to search for cells that could reveal the um, sex of a child, for example, or whatever. So he realized that he had a pathway for prenatal diagnosis, and he knew what that would be because a few years later, in the late 1960s and 70s, there began to be a large push in France, like in the United States with Roe v. Wade, for a loosening of the restrictions against abortion. And the first target of that was individuals with disabilities, of course. Mm. So he, in addition to his scientific recognition, uh, he received the first um, Kennedy Prize from John F. Kennedy at the White House for his work. And, you know, Kennedy had a sister who had yeah. an, uh, intellectual disability. And did a lot, actually, along with the, his sister, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who, along with her husband, Sergeant Shriver, founded the Special Olympics. Sure. They were friends because they were in Paris. He was the ambassador, I think, of Paris at the time, Sergeant mm -hmm. Shriver was. And so they worked with Lejeune. He received the Kennedy Prize in 1962 for his discovery of the White House. He received what's called the William Allen Memorial Award, which is the highest award a geneticist can receive from their um, professional association, wow. and he received that award in San Francisco in 1969. And he was warned by colleagues who knew his views before he gave his acceptance speech for that award, the William Allen Memorial Award. And it was where he he titled his speech, uh, uh, I think it was To Kill or Not to Kill. Hmm. And he said in that address that... Uh, the National Institutes for Health should be called the National Institutes for Death because of their support for prenatal diagnosis and abortion. And he left the days after giving his, his acceptance speech for that award to, in silence. Wow. And he had alienated his colleague. And that was, you mentioned him writing to his wife and, right. and saying that he had lost his Nobel Prize. It was that night that he thought he had lost his Nobel Prize because the scientific and professional community turned against him. And his number of requests to speak at scientific congresses diminished after that, but his pro-life work increased and his work in his lab increased as well, where he had hoped that he would be able to find a cure for Down syndrome. And uh, the foundation is still involved in that quest in Paris. But uh, he, he, he realized the impact that prenatal diagnosis would have on the Down syndrome community. And he's right. You know, in, in the United States today, researchers have shown that the Down syndrome community is about 30% less than it would be if there were wow. no prenatal diagnosis and abortion. Oh. So we know the impact that it continues to have. And that's where the, that's why he had such a, a committed quest for trying to identify what might be a cure. As, as we know more about the impact of having an extra chromosome and the downstream effect of that all throughout the genome, we realize what an incredibly complicated and difficult task that is. Um, but research continues to work to try to at least improve the lives and the comorbidities that are associated with Down syndrome as well. Talk about a profile. So he's an incredible man. It's a profile in courage. I mean, it's as you've just described. I, I want to say say this briefly too, and thank you for that wonderful, uh, appropriately sweeping kind of explanation of who he is. Uh, a man definitely that people should be familiar with. I, I want to say to anybody out there in medical school is applying to residency, and if they don't get into, if they don't match in surgery, uh, read up on Jerome Lejeune because uh, as the as the one great saying is, faith means believing in advance what only makes sense in reverse. Had had Jerome <laughs> Lejeune ended up being a surgeon, I'm sure he would have been an excellent one. But the the future of of um, understanding um, and championing. Uh, uh, the cause of uh, people with Down syndrome, genetic disabilities, intellectual disabilities would be strikingly different, obviously, and, and not never the same. So I want to say to those who get bummed out that if it doesn't work out for their first path, maybe God's got a different path for you, as I think this story really, really tells us. Tell me, Mark, what, um, how did what role did Catholicism play in uh, Jerome Lejeune's life, and, and how did he become venerable in the eyes of the church? Yeah, that's one aspect of his life I didn't mention. I was thinking as you were talking, I should have. Uh, so here's the opportunity. Sure. He was a, he was a committed Catholic. Um, there's really no other way to say it. He, the, his Catholicism was at the center of everything that he did. 
and his value of the human person in the context of what we have been saying, um, the same. He, he, it was the source of his strength. It was the source of his understanding of who, the, who we are as human persons and the inherent dignity we have in Christ. And so he lived that way. And he, he lived with the understanding that, that uh, science didn't have all the answers that sometimes you just get to the end of an issue and all you can do is offer compassion to a patient because mm-hmm. science can't do everything. So he, as we've said, he faced many trials and many obstacles and a lot of criticism and a lot of hate, frankly, from individuals who opposed his views on abortion. And in each of those instances, his Catholicism and his appreciation for the individual led him to tell his children that who would question him on how can you be kind to this person or how can you accept this from that person or whatever. He said, it's not the person that we're fighting against. It's the ideas that the person holds that we're fighting against. We have to remember who the human person is, is created in the image and likeness of God, like the rest of us. So we can't hate the person. We have to fight against the ideas that they hold and try to help them understand that the ideas that they hold are wrong. And in this case, dangerous. So after he died, there was uh, uh, many people who wanted him to be put on the pathway to sainthood. There was an association formed, Les Amis de Jérôme Lejeune, the Friends of Jérôme Lejeune, uh, that exists to this day. And ultimately, his cause for canonization was introduced in the Archdiocese of Paris and progressed along beautifully. I was blessed to be there at the end of the diocesan process in Notre Dame Cathedral, where we carried in boxes of his scientific and personal writings uh, to send them off to Rome to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. And after the investigation of his life, he was uh, determined to have lived a life of heroic virtue. And the life of heroic virtue was lived in the context of the of the world in which he worked and how he stood firm by his beliefs and his faith in Christ and his understanding of the human person. And he never backed down. He lived a virtuous life. He lived a life of love for his fellow human beings, and he did everything that he could to try to improve the quality of life for those that he served. And the church recognized that by giving him the title of venerable, which is where he is today. So if you are in medical school out there and listening, I'm sure that you're facing many challenges and obstacles as well. Everyone in medical school does these days who wants to hold on to their faith. Come to know Jerome Lejeune. Uh, Great man. Great example. Well, and and I know, Mark, that uh, what I didn't want to skip over also was people are saying now, how did this guy who was a a, a band uh, teacher, uh, how did he? How did I mean, an instructor and so on and so on? <laughs> how, wait, wait, how is he carrying documents of uh, Jerome Lejeune in the Notre Dame Cathedral before it goes off to the Vatican? I, I want to make sure you say a word or two, if you can, about your role as executive vice president of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, and also your work with the foundation. Um, I do a little bit of that before we arrive at this this fellowship at the at Word on Fire. So t- tell people a little bit about that. Yes, I I began working at the National Catholic Bioethics Center in 2005. I left teaching, went back to graduate school, taught for 10 years at St. Charles Seminary, as you mentioned, I think, in the introduction, and then had an opportunity to head a small Catholic independent school in Pittsburgh. So we moved out there for a while, and then we ended up coming back, I don't know, four years later, five years later, and I was asked to come back to work for John Haas, who was a good friend and was the president of the National Catholic Bioethics Center. The NCBC's mission is to, um, it was founded in 1972, and its mission is to, is to represent the church's teachings in the area of healthcare and the life sciences and to evaluate procedures, processes, developments in healthcare and the life sciences that would impact human dignity. So I came back, uh, started as a director of development, but soon John made me the executive vice president, and I participated in all the ethicist meetings. I love philosophy and theology. I, I, my mind was stretched beyond my imaginings in those meetings, trying to figure out the principle of a double effect and all these sure. things. But it was a great experience and a great opportunity to get around the country and meet really some wonderful people, but also to be challenged to understand the, the church is teaching in these areas. So Thierry de la Ville who was the director general of the foundation, the Jerome Jean Foundation in Paris, came to the U.S. to visit. And he was here, wanted to meet with John Haas, who happened to be in Europe, and asked if I would take him to lunch. But he was here to look into the possibilities of opening an outreach of the foundation in the U.S. 
So John asked if I would take him to lunch, knowing we have a son with Down syndrome, which I was happy to do. We had a great conversation. He's a wonderful man. He's he's he's, he's hard to describe, but he's mm. this he's this beautiful French gentleman who is just overflowing with joy. He wow. He's retired recently with the foundation, but he was a great, great guy. So we had a great lunch. We talked about Jerome Lejeune, and I learned for the first time what was going on in the area of research uh, to improve the lives of individuals with Down syndrome and other genetic intellectual disabilities as well. So uh, there was a book, a small book called Life is a Blessing that Lejeune's daughter, Clara Gaimar, had written. Uh, there was a short biography that she had actually written so her children wouldn't forget their grandfather. But they were wanting to have the English version of that reprinted um, and getting ready for a conference that was happening in New York that um, was being held. Uh, so anyway, I had contacts at Ignatius Press who had the initial imprint on that and, I, and the, in the English translation. So I got in touch with Ignatius and it turned out they had the whatever it is that you have to have to make a book <laughs> sure, still available yeah. <clears throat> and they could so it was a pretty easy thing to do we turned it around quickly and they had that ready to go for the conference in new york where clara was speaking wow so that was great and then it was just a, a process of getting pulled in more and more they brought me to paris to their their international scientific congress on intellectual disability and decided since they had an american in paris that they would hire a videographer who would come and I would interview all these different researchers who were Amazing. in these areas. So, you know, I was there with, you know, these people like Bill Mobley from University of California, San Diego is one of the top investigators in the area of Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, people from different parts of the world who spoke English. I had, all my questions were able to be asked and answered there. So eventually we did a feasibility study. They wanted to open here and I, I'm making a long story, maybe longer, but no, they they asked me ultimately, they talked to John first, if he would release me and he agreed. And so I went to work to start the foundation here in 2012. So, yeah, that was the pathway. I, a teacher in Santa Barbara, California in the, in the 1980s, I would have never imagined that I would one day be <laughs> making presentations on genetics and neuroscience and be in labs and seeing the things I was seeing. It's been an amazing life. God rides straight with crooked lines, right? That's for sure. Well, and then all of a sudden, one day you see that Word on Fire, the Word on Fire Institute is, is, uh, has <laughs> posted a, the Venerable Jerome Lejeune Fellowship. Um, what did you think about that? And then I want to ask you, what has been your understanding as to why Word on Fire has decided to actually create such a fellowship? Yeah, well, I had, I had gone back to my origins in a sense, and I was working as the executive director for a network of independent Catholic classical schools here in the Philadelphia area called the Regina Academies, or four schools. And I was happy and content. And then a friend of mine uh, of many years sent an article to me in Crux magazine that was announcing this position of this venerable Jerome Lejeune Fellowship at Word on Fire. Jerome Lejeune, that name just... Uh, when Jerome Lejeune speaks, you listen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. When Mia Patton speaks, you listen. If there's anyone who's yeah. old enough to yeah, yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. So I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, should I? Shouldn't I? And I looked at the description. I thought, well, I've done everything that they're wanting. You know, I've I've been involved in this world. I have connections all over the world. I I've written on these topics. I, so and I always have a resume current just because it's the thing to do. Yeah. So I fired off a cover letter and a list of things that could be found online that I'd written and things that I'd done, interviews and whatever, and sent it off and got a call back from Lucas Sykes, who's the HR director at Word on Fire, for, and uh, had a great conversation with him. And, and uh, by the third conversation, I was offered the position and happily came uh, because it's this area, this world of disability and the needs that individuals with disabilities have, especially in the church, I think, are are great and it's a, an incredible opportunity at this point in life to be able to to blend my interest in 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 the area of disability and the needs of individuals with disabilities with my love for the roman catholic faith and the needs of parishes and churches and that's what this fellowship is about really it's the Jerome Lejeune was was in a sense a catholic foundation because we're all catholics but mm -hmm. you know we worked mm -hmm. in a secular world we upheld Catholic ideals and everything that we funded, of course. Um, but this is a, an opportunity to work for Jerome Lejeune and Word on Fire 
to try to provide um, a growing presence for individuals who have disabilities in parishes and in the life of the church. So certainly there's a pro-life component to it, and we've already done a lot in that, you know, posting articles and conversations, various things about raising the awareness of the impact that prenatal diagnosis and abortion is having on the population, but also an opportunity to work toward greater inclusion of individuals with disabilities in the life of the church. Where appropriate. Yeah. Well, Mark, you've been a blessing uh, to the Institute, but also to the cause. So, so it's just wonderful to have you uh, in this position. And I think it is a truly a providential one that, that uh, we were as the Institute blessed to have you kind of, land in this position. So we're, we're so excited about that. Segment four, life unworthy of life. In the wake of World War II, German Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller popularized a chilling quote on the dangers of passivity in times of great moral crisis. First, they came for the socialists, Niemöller said, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Mark, when we have discussed the tragic statistics about disabilities and abortion, as well as the heinous fate of the disabled under the Nazi T4 euthanasia program, which would proudly exterminate, quote, life unworthy of life, you said this to me. The degradation of human dignity goes far beyond those living with disabilities. The legalization of euthanasia is evidence that what begins with accepting the abortion of babies with disabilities ultimately leads to the total devaluation of life that some in society decide is no longer useful. Could you tell me a little bit more about this? Sure. Uh, you know, I think we, we talked some about human dignity in this yeah. conversation, Todd, and I, I think really it, it, it boils down to what we value as a culture and how we view the human person and what we celebrate in humanity. And what we celebrate is all the things that really don't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter ultimately how much money we have. It doesn't matter you know, if we can have some sort of great record producer that makes us sound great so we sell millions of copies of an album and get a Grammy Award. Yeah. It doesn't matter if we're an actor and, and get some recognition as an actor. None of these things matter. Our looks don't matter. These things just don't matter. They're, they're aspects of our humanity, but they're not at the core of our humanity. And it's the core of our humanity is where the, it's the gift of our humanity that has come from God, who recognizes us all as persons created in his image and, and redeemed by his son, Jesus Christ. And that's really what matters. So, you know, I, frankly, I have some, sometimes the disability community can even be somewhat guilty of promoting abilities mm. and not promoting the individual, the value of the individual human person for who that human person is. So I think we always have to be careful and on trying to, well, I, I think we need to make as a goal, restoring an understanding of the human person and who we are as created in the image of God and redeemed by his son, Jesus Christ. And, and as much as we can get away from these other things. And I think it's these other things, it's, it's the utility that flows from that perception, perception of the human person that is where we get into trouble in all these areas. So, you know, um, how much can that person contribute to society? Yeah. Will that person, like the city councilman in Massachusetts, yeah. will that person cost us too much? Uh, that person doesn't have anything to offer society and he's going to be expensive or she. So let's let's make sure we can take care of the problem before they're born. And then when we get old, uh, we, we lose our usefulness to society. And if we become sick, our family doesn't want to take care of us. Or, you know, I have a, a dear friend who's Catholic, lives out west in California, whose mother just died recently. And she went through this with her brother, one of her brothers, and it's a Catholic family. One of her brothers was saying, you know, California has a sister suicide provision in law now. So you can, you know, if you don't want to suffer through this cancer in your last days, you can just take care of it. Horrific idea mm. Mm. that we can just toss people aside because we no longer see their usefulness or, or we have this perception of life. And I, you, you alluded to this earlier in this conversation, but the despair that's in our culture nowadays People are largely despairing in the culture because they don't, 
we've been conditioned to believe that every day should just be great. Every yeah. day should be rosy. I should be yeah. happy. I should be prosperous. I, life, that's not life. We've lost our groundings and the reality, the value of suffering as much as we hate to go through it. But all of those things that make us truly human. And when you have that attitude toward the human person, the human person is only seen as as a utility, as having a utilitarian purpose in society, and that person is able to be dispensed with if they can't provide for society in what we we see as a useful way. I was going to ask you, as you're alluding to it, um, and especially that whole the the temptation of utilitarianism. What is your sense about ideology playing in all of this? I mean, uh, it, it it does. Do, is ideology one of the prime uh, concerns that we as Catholics have to contend with when it comes to uh, reminding people of the dignity of the human life that our society is saying this is it's dispensable? You know, I think I don't know if, I don't know if it was uh, I maybe Hubert Humphrey at one point who talked about the dawn of life, the 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 the, tw- the twilight of life, and the and the shadows of life. That it's our job to to help or preserve or or champion people to find themselves in those places. Um, it doesn't seem that that's the conversation anymore. And that may not be Hubert Humphrey, but I'm, I'm, that's what's just, uh, coming to mind. Uh, w- you know, is it is it an ideological mindset that makes us sort of brush off the notion that these are these lives are valuable, notwithstanding that they may be, they, it, may, it may require patience, that it may require sacrifice, it may require extra work, that it may require money and, and resources and so on. What is it that makes us jettison the notion of dignity in the midst of difficulty for the sake of, let's solve this problem? It's a, it's a, it's a problem to be solved. Yeah, you know, an ideology really is a, it's a grasping of an isolated view or an isolated idea of something, I think. Um, and it's probably not a very good description. Probably couldn't find it in the dictionary anywhere. Yeah. But we talked earlier about classical education, you know, and, and, and the goal of a classical education is to understand everything as a whole, to see the world as a whole in all of its perspectives and understand the human person, the incarnation is the origin of that. When we move away from that, we, we can focus on our uh, specific interests, I think, to an obsessive degree. Mm. And to that extent, I would think, yes, ideology could be driving all of this uh, an ideology of, of utilitarian purpose of the human person an ideology that power is at the heart of all human relationships an ideology that that human life is has no transcendent purpose uh, human yeah. life is only purpose is to accomplish something here on earth and then poof it's gone and and those who have power can wield that power over the weak in a way that is completely the antithesis of everything we know to be true from the gospel. Yeah. So to that extent, yeah, I think I think we're largely an ideologically driven society. And the more that we dig ourselves into our ideologies, we find ourselves in conflict with others because other people hold different ideologies than ours, and it puts a, it pits us against one another in a very unhealthy way. Uh, you can't sustain a culture on that. You have to sustain a culture on shared views and not not uh, stakes in the ground, I guess, for lack of a better phrase that comes to mind at the moment. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Well said. Sort of reason why you, you probably yeah. have a better idea. No, no, no. I, I just, I was curious what your thoughts were on this. It's interesting because you make me think of, <clears throat> excuse me, Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago talked about... Um, I think he said, "Why is it that uh, that uh, Macbeth only killed whatever six or seven people, and Stalin didn't stop at a million? And uh, Solzhenitsyn's answer was that uh, Macbeth, Macbeth had no ideology. Um, that at the end mm. of the day, we, we can dispassionately champion terrible things in the name of some larger intellectual philosophical construct." Um, and sort of almost stiffen ourselves to the notion that we're doing something bad because somehow in some way we're going to say we're doing it uh, for the greater good. And, and actually Eric Hobsbawm, I think, was a Marxist historian who after the Soviet Union fell, I think in 1994, was being interviewed and was asked, you know, by Michael Ignatieff in a, in a televised interview, you know, if, if, if knowing knowing that it would require to the killing of tens of millions of people uh, in the in the whole Soviet and communist enterprise, you would ultimately achieve uh, the paradise you were striving for would have been worth it. And Hobbesbaum said, yes. Uh, you know, sort of this terrible Machiavellian, 
we can we can sort of jettison the lives of these people. We can just destroy them in the name of a larger a larger uh, uh, dream. And and what's interesting is I think sometimes the people the champion that don't think about themselves and their families being among the millions that were killed. They are always sort of the ones that are the beneficiaries of it and so on and so forth. So I just, I, I think, yeah, ideology, I think, along with what you're saying, I think it just blinds us to rationalize that doing evil things isn't evil because there's some sort of a greater good or greater convenience. And and that's that's a trap. I think it's a great trap. Mark, I want to, you've been so generous with your time. I want to ask you uh, one, one uh, two last questions. Um, one is what would uh, what would Venerable Jerome Lejeune make of the state of things today? I think he died. I think it was in 1994. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Um, here we are, 30 years, nearly 30 years later. What would he make of the state of the world uh, and the state of the the issues he was championing when he passed away? And then, secondly, what advice can you give to others out there um, who might who who might want to better love and respect and fully integrates our brothers, sisters, parents, children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So the first question is, what would what would Jerome Lejeune make of things today? And secondly, how can we do better with these special people in our lives? Jerome Lejeune was always pretty good at seeing the contradictions that existed in society. And I think he would see those contradictions now as he did when he was living. I think he would appreciate the progress that was made. I think he would be delighted to see the amount of research that's being done and how his ideas have, have permeated throughout the scientific community so that many in the absence of funding largely are pursuing what he had hoped would be a reality at some point. I think he would be disheartened to see that in the midst of that, the human person was continued to be degraded through research that's being done using human tissue, for example, human embryonic or fetal tissue. Some of that research intended to improve the lives of the individuals that he cared for so deeply, the individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, uh, he, he was a man whose heart was filled of love for all humanity, so I'm sure his heart would be breaking in many, in many sure. ways, but would be elated in others at the same time. Yeah. And seeing the progress, he would love to see what his family has continued in the foundation that he asked to be created after he died. That would, or he didn't ask for a foundation, but he asked for some way that his work would continue, that his family realized in the context of the establishment of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation mm -hmm. in France. So, uh, you know, he was he was a uh, he was an amazing man, and uh, um, I, I think just that, Todd. I think I think he would he would see the conflict, he would see the good, and he would lament the direction that many go, but be quick to point out the progress being made at the same time because he was an optimist ultimately. Right. Very hopeful. And, and any advice for those who want to make a difference to, to those uh, with intellectual or de developmental disabilities in their own lives? Sure. You know, assuming it's mostly Catholics that will watch this or listen to this podcast. So look for individuals with disabilities in your parishes. I've been doing a lot of reading lately and just submitted an article to Word on Fire yesterday that deals with the inclusion of individuals with disabilities in parishes. Many individuals, uh, many families um, don't bring individuals, for example, with autism who might stem, you know, they start flapping their arms mm. and making vocal sounds. They're kept away from mass because they're afraid there'll be a distraction. I think when we see individuals with disabilities in, at mass and we see maybe how their families are struggling, we need to encourage them, be kind, thank them for being there, ask how we can help. Um, we need to find those people who aren't coming to mass as much as we can and try to encourage them in. Befriend individuals with disabilities, work toward inclusion in parish schools. Um, just support them, love yeah. them. Um, yeah. And learn, you know, I learned about Jerome Lejeune. I, Ode to God, Jerome Lejeune's postulator, has written a beautiful biography of Jerome Lejeune. So for anyone who's interested in in learning more about his life, and I wish I could remember the name of the book, it was just translated into English and published by Ignatius Press at the end of 2021, I think. So if anyone is interested, just go to Ignatius Press and search on Jerome Lejeune, and you'll find the book by Ode, A-U-D-E, Dugas, D-U-G-A-S-T, 
and it's a beautiful, beautiful story of his life and gives a lot of inspiration. Uh, again, we talked about medical students and people involved in the medical profession as doctors get to know him, yeah. pray to him for guidance and for his intercession and, and carry on, you know, carry on and uphold the, the dignity of the human person and, and put down in any, any good and Christian and prayerful way those who would continue to contribute to the degradation of the human person anywhere that we find it. And there's so many ways nowadays where that's happening. We talked about disability. It's not only in that area. It's not only euthanasia. Everything between a prenatal diagnosis yeah. and death, there are many pitfalls that are, are really working against us in so many ways now. See people for who they are. It's not all about power. It's all about love. Mm-hmm. Mark Bradford, teacher, leader, father, and the Venerable Jerome Lejeune Fellow from the Word on Fire Institute. Thanks so much, Mark, for taking the time to talk. It's been a pleasure, as always, to talk with you. Todd, it's been great. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again for the opportunity, and thanks for all you do for Word on Fire. The journal is astounding. Thank you. So I've been thinking. In the 1920s, the curmudgeonly H.L. Mencken, a writer, social critic, and editor of the American Mercury, eulogized the death of the early 20th century liberal movement. And he did it with a smirk. Here's what Mencken said happened. The liberal movement has changed because they no longer believe in the mob, because they are no longer Democrats, because they have come to see at last that the morons they once sweated to save do not want to be saved and are not worth saving. Now, let me stop right there and define what Mencken means by moron. Moron, in today's parlance, simply means someone who is stupid, in the most general sense, or is acting stupid. But in the early 20th century, along with the terms idiot, imbecile, and feeble-minded, the word moron carried a more clinical, albeit still derogatory, meaning. Moros comes from the Greek, dull, and thus the term moron was assigned to people who had a more pronounced degree of intellectual or developmental disability. Now to be sure, we can look at the original characterization of a select group of people as morons as anything ranging from inartful to downright offensive. But in the early 20th century, with the advent of an, an enthusiastic and crusading eugenics movement, that classification soon became indisputably dangerous. Eugenics was a pseudoscience championed not only by elitists and racists, but also by many mainstream physicians and scientists, politicians and legal minds, journalists and cultural commentators. It was an incomplete and ultimately immoral understanding of genetics and population health that championed minimizing bad genes and propagating good genes through public policy. Morons and imbeciles, schizophrenics and criminals should be discouraged or prevented from breeding it was taught. The beautiful and the brilliant should be encouraged to be fruitful. The eugenics movement began as a campaign for genetic hygiene and ended in abject ignominy with American state-mandated sterilizations and German T4 extermination programs, as well as Joseph Mengele's experiments in concentration camps. G.K. Chesterton reminded Mencken the intellectual, Mencken the opinion maker, Mencken the wise, that wrong is wrong even if everybody is wrong about it. Chesterton would go on saying, for Catholics, it is a fundamental dogma of the faith that all human beings, without any exception whatever, were specially made, were shaped and pointed like shining arrows for the end of hitting the mark of beatitude. As such, Chesterton would continue, there will be Diocletian persecutions, there will be Dominican crusades, there will be rending of all religious peace and compromise, or even the end of civilization and the world before the Catholic Church will admit that one single moron or one single man is not worth saving. Today, in a world of advancing science and technology, but withering faith and compassion, we must beware eugenics under another name. Genetically guided abortions, socially promoted euthanasia, or creative forms of ostracizing or marginalizing the intellectually or developmentally disabled devalues those in the dawn of life, the twilight of life, or the shadows of life. Instead, like Chesterton, may we recognize our brothers and sisters with such disabilities not as morons or as the feeble-minded not worth saving, but as shining arrows hitting the mark of beatitude. And one last thing. 
For this week's book, I would heartily recommend G.K. Chesterton's 1922 classic indictment of the scientifically organized society called Eugenics and Other Evils, as well as his chapter, Is Humanism a Religion?, from his collection of essays, The Thing. These are works of a master Catholic mind confronting the twin threats of scientism and nihilism. Definitely worth your time. Thank you for listening to the Evangelization and Culture podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to Word on Fire's YouTube channel, leave a review, and share with your friends. And don't forget to get a free copy of Word on Fire's award-winning journal, Evangelization and Culture, at wordonfire.org journal. Until next time, I'm Todd Warner. Please keep proclaiming Christ to a hungry culture.